To what extent is Sweller's cognitive load theory, guided by knowledge of human cognition, an effective in practical learning applications? Cognitive load theory has been described by educationalist Dylan William as the single most important thing for teachers to know. Children's time in school is precious, and a theory that is robustly underpinned by evidence that, and that seeks to optimise every moment in the classroom has significant implications for any conscientious teacher. In this presentation, I seek to establish how CLT works and critically evaluate its effectiveness. The term cognitive load theory was coined in 1988 by John Sweller and reflects two ideas. The first being that there is a limit to how much new information our brains can process at a time, as working memory is very limited. The second is that stored information, once moved into long-term memory, is unlimited. For learning to take place, this information needs to be transferred from working to long-term memory, which is, as Sweller states, indescribably large, unquote, having an endless capacity for storage. In a 2017 lecture, he went, at, he went as far as to describe human beings as consisting of, and in effect being, quote, our long-term memories. They describe us as cognitive beings, unquote. Unfortunately, there is what he describes as a bottleneck between the two, the short and long-term memories. This means that information that does not get transferred from one to the other is ultimately lost and forgotten. CLT is about recognising the bottleneck and improving the transfer from working to long-term memory. It supports explicit models of instruction, the fundamental purpose being to improve the quality of instructional design by paying attention to the role of working memory. It is a timely theory on which to focus, particularly as increased distractions, for example, learners being introduced to smartphones and video games from a young age, overload students' cognition, leading demonstrably to a reduction in academic success. For me, CLT is fascinating as I have deep and frustrating memories from school days of feeling left behind, confused and overwhelmed by too much content too quickly delivered. Sweller refers to such experiences. Excessive cognitive load can be caused by transient information. In studying this learning theory, I had a series of epiphanies as CLT makes sense of why this happens and what we as prospective teachers can do to maximise the learning of individuals within our classrooms. There is an impressive uh, empirical body of evidence and key recommendations that appear to work. However, it is not a cure-all or a catch-all remedy for all teaching circumstances. Like other theories, it has limitations, borrows from other research, and raises questions. Like all theories, Sweller's CLT does not emerge from nowhere. In the 1950s, G. A. Miller published a classic paper suggesting that our short-term memory capacity is limited, and empirically demonstrating that human beings can hold seven plus or minus two units of information in short-term memory. This gave rise to the term chunking by Simon and Chase, who were the first to use this description of memory components. Sweller, echoing Piaget, prefers to use the term schema to convey a meaningful pattern of information which is easier to store. He also acknowledges a debt to Badley and Hitch, 1974, who view human cognitive architecture as the working and the long-term memory. In addition, he mentions the legacy of David Geary, who organised learning into two sets of skills, biologically primary and biologically secondary skills. The first are complex but easy for most to, to acquire, such as speech, walking, problem solving, generalising, transferring, facial recognition and social skills. The biologically secondary skills consist of everything taught and learned in schools and beyond. Schools were invented, Sweller, Sweller claims, to teach biologi biologically secondary information. If we could learn this as easily as the biologically primary stuff, we would. For example, reading and writing existed for 5,000 years, but most people could not read or write before mass education. Maths, literature or science are not things we pick up naturally. Biological primary skills are most, mostly co generic cognitive skills which do not need instruction, whilst domain specific skills are not picked up unconsciously and need instruction. One key reason why so many people have found cognitive load theory helpful is that it has a, sec has a single focus, that of improving instruction. Uh, quote, the ultimate aim of cognitive load theory is to provide instructional eff effects leading to instructional recommendations. How can CLT help teachers in the classroom and with their pedagogy? With all learning theories, the challenge is to translate research findings into a form that permits busy teachers to apply them. The five principles that underlie the theory have been helpfully given initial letters A to E to make them easier to remember by Oliver Lavelle. They are architecture, the cognitive architecture of 
human memory, biology, biologically primary and secondary information, categorization, categorization of intrinsic and extraneous load, domains, domain general versus domain specific knowledge, elements, element interactivity, the source of co cognitive load. Together, these five principles work to produce a fundamental rec re recommendation of cognitive load theory in order to increase learning, reduce extraneous load and optimize intrinsic load. The cognitive architecture of human memory consists of three components, the environment, the working memory, and the long-term memory. While working memory is limited to between four and seven elements of information and is a limited thinking system, the environment and, lo and the long-term memory are both unlimited stores of information, the one external and the other internal. The interactions between the three elements are represented in the slides. Information from outside enters the working memory, and if processed by thought and by linking it to prior knowledge, it can move to the long-term memory. Once stored in the long-term memory, it can be retrieved or lost if insufficiently used. When we become confused, feel overburdened with too many ideas, or struggle to follow an explanation, it is because the working memory, the bottleneck, is overloaded. In CLT, cognitive load represents anything taking up working memory capacity since working memory can only process a limited number of elements at once. The ability to think complex thoughts is dependent on the, thought, uh, on the fact that not all elements of information are the same. Once, in, once stored in the long-term memory, smaller elements combine to form larger elements, a process known as chunking. Thus, new information takes up more working memory capacity than, than familiar information. For example, a child learning to read will see each alphabet shape as a separate entity, such as H-O-U-S-E. Over time, they will see the new word house, and think about, thinking about reading or writing the word will become effortless, and the concept will combine with other similar buildings. As previously discussed, the difference between biologically primary and biologically secondary knowledge is an ease of acquisition, as proposed by David Geary. It contrasts unconscious learning, facial recognition and speech, rather than the effortful acquisition of knowledge such as mathematics, in Sweller's words, uh, quote, biologically secondary knowledge is knowledge we need because our culture has determined that it is important, unquote. Therefore, it must be taught in schools. Categorization divides load into extraneous, intrinsic and germane. Extraneous load is harmful to learning as it does not contribute. The intrinsic load is necessary to learning, but potentially harmful if it is too high, as it can lead to cognitive overload. The germane load is the Goldilocks of learning, as it, in, as it directly contributes to learning. It consists of well-designed instruction that directly facilitates schema construction. By use of explicit teaching and many worked examples, clearly demonstrating how to do a maths problem, for example, since the primary purpose of CLT is to work out how best to use the limited learning resources that we have, the goal is to reduce extraneous load that does not maximise learning, optimise intrinsic load as it is the load that should occupy students' working minds, and hone it into a germane load by placing a lower cognitive load on the student, helping them to learn and, to, and remember how to solve the problem again. Reducing extraneous load might involve noticing where materials might risk splitting the attention of the learner, or where, the, where verbal and written materials are, are provided simultaneously, and remedying these, er these errors. It takes discipline on the part of the teacher to edit what might seem like interesting, amusing or helpful de details in order to allow the student to focus. General versus specific refer to any field in which an individual can make the journey from novice to expert. Domain general skills are seen as transferable, for example, problem solving or critical thinking skills, which some have considered worth teaching as subjects in themselves. Domain specific skills are, apl are applicable in a limited field such as music or chess. Cognitive load theory categorizes the domain general skills as biologically primary knowledge, not needing specific instruction, as we have evolved to require them automatically without instruction. In any biologically secondary area, the difference between a novice and an expert is time and experience, creating differential knowledge held in long term memory. Thus, for CLT, the way to get better at problem solving or critical thinking in maths, literature or chess is to learn more about maths, literature or chess, a result of more time spent chunking, automating and committing to long-term memory. Finally, the element interactivity of, or source of cognitive load. Whether something is difficult or easy to learn, 
depends on the number of intrinsic elements, which depend on the task itself, as well as the learner's prior knowledge. Skillful curriculum sequencing and minimising extraneous uh, in interacting elements create good instructional design. Ideas in practice. As a classroom teacher faced with a lesson that represents entirely new content for the pupils, the ideas behind CLT would become extremely relevant as they are novice learners. Uh, if the content of that day's lesson is more about consolidation and applying previously learnt material, the ideas would be less relevant and the different levels in the cognitive domain as set out by Benjamin Bloom might be more useful. Preparing learning objectives to test and stretch the learner's abilities and desired learning outcomes. For the novice learner, imagining a bottleneck which needs information to be chunked into bite-sized pieces is a helpful analogy to prevent overloading working memory. Small steps such as those made by Dr. Fred Jones when teaching maths to the novice learner using VIP or visual instructional plans are invaluable, such as breaking down the method of calculating the area of a rectangle. Uh, CLT researchers such as Sepp et al. in 2019 have shown how restricted working memory can be extended by using physical movement. Pupils found it much easier to learn how to tie knots or to, sp or to fold paper, see the example of extraneous detail removed, uh, if they were encouraged to attempt the technique as they were being taught it for the first time. Rather than, rather than merely watching a demonstration and then copying after. Physical movements, such as counting on fingers, help to, help to keep this information rather than relying just on working memory. Tracing shapes, lines and angles on, on some worked examples in maths also proved more helpful to the pupils than the control group who did not trace. Possibly the best known and oldest CLT technique shown to reduce load on working memory is that of the worked example. Teachers are familiar with the idea of a waggle, what a good one looks like, and, the, and for the novice learner, seeing a worked example rather than trying to hold in working memory all the steps required helps them to solve the next problem. One of the most exciting areas of research examines the efficacy of worked examples when used during homework. A study by Ward and Sweller had a control group of students complete 10 standard uh, homework problems compared to an alternating worked example slash problem sample. Uh, the following day, the worked example group outperformed the other group despite only having done half as many problems. Sometimes pupils are not, are, are not yet ready for the consolidation, which homework is supposed to promote. Persisting with examples until the students are completely familiar with the material is beneficial. In their seminal book on cognitive load theory, Sweller, Ayres and uh, Kal Kaliga uh, write um, arguably, the, wor the worked example effect is the most important of the cognitive load theory effects." Unquote. They, are not a su they are not a substitute for teaching, however, they work, on, they work as a substitute for the list of problems that students are usually asked to solve after the lesson. The lesson followed by worked examples as guided practice is the model that works. The, uh, quote, the most efficient method of studying examples and solving problems is to present a worked example and then immediately follow this with this example by asking the learner to solve a similar problem." Unquote. This prevents the problem of the student's working memories becoming overloaded during the traditional long instructional phase. The alteration strategy keeps instruction within the bounds of learners' working memories. As the pupil's expertise grows, teachers can reduce the amount of detail included in the worked examples. This is known as faded scaffolding and creates a gradual increase in challenge. It allows for the expert's reversal effect to occur, novice, adept, expert. Novices learn best with explicit instruction and work, worked examples and experts learn best when direction is minimized. In terms of resources, the focus on freeing up the learner's working memory to its best advantage means that resources should be uh, part part down and extraneous visual noise re removed. For example, the use of text boxes, colour, which serves no purpose, and numbers with no significance or relevance to the amount, as well as distractive images and fu fussy fonts. Icons rather than pictures to promote visual clues, alignment and columns and order uh, rather than random arrangement. Restricting the text to a ma maximum of two fonts and a lot of white space can all serve to create a memorable and clutter-free resource. As shown here is Chandler and Sweller's own example of reducing extraneous text and diagrams. Um, 
students presented with the simplest form of uh, these instructions performed better than the, than the other two groups, uh, despite spending the shortest amount of time studying the diagram prior to testing. There are other elements to restricting extraneous or redundant, redundant information, such as not delivering PowerPoints by simply reading out the content and avoiding the split attention effect of two sources of information placed apart, where excessive cognitive load is caused by the fleeting effect of transient information. In the words of Sweller and colleagues, if the two sources of information can be understood in isolation, only one source, either the audio or the visual source, should be used. If both are used, one source will be redundant and having to, having to process both will lead to an extraneous cognitive load. Uh, end quote. The urge to repeat information, thinking the students need both forms, is strong. However, the messages from the researchers are, research are clear. If a diagram is clear, do not add text. Don't give a PowerPoint with the text repeating, and the less put on the PowerPoint, the better. The question of how people learn best has long been debated. One school holds that all people learn best when allowed to discover information for themselves. For example, Bruner, 1961. On the other are those who believe in explicit instructional guidance in which teachers demonstrate students what to do and how to do it. Leading theorists of CLT argue that for novices, direct, Explicit instruction is more, in, more effective than partial guidance. They recognise the need for learners to be given the opportunity to work in groups and solve problems independently, but to practice newly learnt content rather than to discover information. Research by Andrew Martin 2016 uh, recommends designing a teaching model around CLT and suggests that um, less structured approaches can benefit more experienced learners, promoting learner independence while at the same time if the instructor provides some, gu some guiding principles, prior, prior information, signposts along the way, and scaffolds and assistance when, ne where needed, there is less burden on working memory. End quote. Uh, he suggests that managing the cognitive load of learners through explicit instruction leads to higher levels of motivation and engagement. Uh, for me, while I accept the evidence that it is a transformative theory for both teaching and learning, the fact is that there are many factors that can affect an individual's working memory, as well as long-term memory. So further, dis further research is needed to consider elements such as the environment, distraction and gender differences. Thinking of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if a child is hungry or suffering from anxiety, memory is bound to be badly affected and learning is sev learning severely compromised. Conversely, an approach that draws on cognitive re research is probably more helpful than any other uh, even in extreme circumstances. For novice learners, the ideas of CPL are more obviously relevant than for covering it previously learnt material, although for revision, ideas such as redundant, reducing transient information to avoid cognitive overload must be valuable. To level the playing field, preloading children with selected vocabulary, vocabulary so that they are prepared for the, lesson, for the ideas in the lesson is important. Obviously, Every student is different and, is, and it is very difficult to gauge how much cognitive load each one can take, and guesswork will always result in error. It is important also not to confuse the message of optimising cognitive load with reducing it, and the aim should be for the Goldilocks effect to get it just right. Too much cognitive load leads to information getting lost, but the uh, reciprocal danger is that students will not learn enough. With any cognitive psychology tool, the danger when it becomes popular is that it, it could be dumbed down and overly simplified. If it is both hard to measure and important to optimise cognitive load, then using the theory with a cl large class becomes challenging. Each, each child will have a different optimal load based on, various pre based on previous knowledge, and the additional workload to the teacher of differenti differentiation could outweigh the usefulness of the theory if it is misinterpreted. Therefore, it is, it is not enough simply to know about cognitive load theory to become a skillful teacher. The impact of, of transferring information from working to long-term memory is important, but will only reach so far. The teaching strategies to accompany and facilitate cognitive load theory are equally important, uh, such as retrieval practice, interleaving, dual coding and spacing, organisational cues and mental coat hook. Uh, modelling learning behaviour in front of children and using success schema to give them a preset of confidence that they can achieve are also vital. I am impressed by Bloom's, Bloom's taxonomy with its ascending ladder of learning levels. 
from simple recall to the ability to evaluate and create, together with the question prompts it, prompts it suggests, having seen a large colourful version displayed in the secondary English classroom to prompt both teachers and learners to aim high in pursuit of subject mastery. Uh, so taking all of this into consideration, when thinking about my own practice, the following elements of cognitive load theory I believe are vital to my pedagogy. Uh, explicit guidance accompanied by worked examples and feedback, at least at the novice stage of learning. Uh, Modelling problem solving behaviour. Uh, interleaving. Um, CLT to support fully guided instruction for novice learners. They gain expertise. It, it supports the steady inclusion of an independent problem solving tasks to extend more expert learners. Chunking, designing the lesson in steps for easy assimilation. Preloading, levelling the playing field to give children with a, with a variety of background knowledge the subject specific vocabulary needed to succeed in the higher learning, learning exercises. Uh, not over labelling diagrams when broaching a new topic to avoid the redundancy effect. Um, avoiding the split attention effect where two or more sources of information have to be processed at once. Integrating separate, not separate sources of information for ease of absorption and avoidance of transient noise. Um, too much content so fast that none of the information um, goes in and is wasted. The teaching profession continues to become more engaged with research, especially as huge strides in the field of neuroscience and metacognition are being made. Cognitive load theory is based on our knowledge of human cognition and uses the evolutionary basis of human um, cognitive architecture to develop instructional procedures. It offers evidence-backed evidence practical strategies and sound advice on how to optimise learning when used correctly, especially for teaching novices in subjects such as maths, science and technology. However, as with all theories, it should be used thoughtfully and critically alongside other tried and trusted techniques. Uh, that's the end of my presentation. Sorry I went over the time limit so much, but um, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much for listening.